Mindy Grossman, HSN. Inc. Inc. Well, Mindy, thanks for sitting down with me. I wanted to talk a little bit about the changes that you've been able to incorporate. Uh, when you got there, you had an organization with a phenomenal brand, uh, but you went and incorporated a number of different changes to really enhance that brand. Can you talk about what it was like when you got there and how you approached it? Sure. Um, you know, I was the eighth CEO in 10 years to come into the company. And my background was really brands and storytelling and really creating consumer connection. So the idea of being able to go to a brand that had such an intimate relationship one-on-one -on -one with the consumer was very exciting to me, and especially a brand that could create content. But as you can imagine, when a company has eight CEOs in 10 years, it becomes like Miss Havisham and Great Expectations. Mm -hmm. It's frozen. And what we really had to do was redefine the brand for today, unleash the potential of the organization, and then build a business strategy, a product strategy, and a long-term vision that really came from the core of the brand strategy. So the first thing that I did in the first very intense six months, I had two primary focus. One, really engage the culture, mm -hmm and two, do a tremendous amount of work around our consumer and our brand so we could identify what were our points of differentiation that were gonna allow us to get the business started again. So we did a lot of consumer work. I think listening is the most important thing in today's environment. And we really determined what we were gonna do going forward and the aha moment for us and what we felt was our critical point of differentiation was that we weren't just a traditional retailer. Mm -hmm. We weren't just a linear television channel and we weren't just a company about transaction. So how could we take what then was what I just mentioned mm -hmm. and transform it to this idea of editorial programmed commerce? So we had to look through a different lens. We had to look at we're competing with the Food Network, we're competing with HGTV, we're competing with Style, as well as the broader digital and retail landscape. Once we did that and said, we are gonna be about bringing experiences to life across our myriad of content screens, mm -hmm. and it's gonna be about great product, great story, great storyteller, and bringing that to life for consumers, it unleashed the world of potential that we really had. And so we did that from May 2006 to October 2006. October 2006, we erected a giant tent on our campus mm -hmm. and we were able to present the new brand of HSN to our 2,500 plus employees, some on the campus and then we beamed it via satellite to our other facilities. We rolled out the new brand, the positioning, there's the new tagline, there's no place like, mm -hmm. and we communicated what the business strategy was going to be now that we really had a reason to be competitive and a reason to touch people with our brand. And that was really the tipping point for everything that we've done since then. Interesting, you know, you mentioned uh, culture being the first step you had to take. Once you were able to roll that, you had the tent, you were launching this to people. How did you then communicate that message to them to get everybody going the same direction from that point forward? I think it's really important. Um, you know, and I've worked for brands like Nike, for Ralph Lauren, and one of the things I've learned is there's no such thing as over communication. People need to understand not only the functional aspect of what you're doing, but what it means to them, what it means to their ability to be successful, what it means to their job, what it means to their role as an evangelist for the company. Mm -hmm. So in addition to you know that two-hour presentation, we then, myself, the entire executive team, the entire leadership team, cascaded that through the organization in a very, detailed way. We integrated it into all our performance plans okay. so people could identify what their objectives needed to be against the business and the brand mission. We were able to have those conversations. And I think you know people need simplicity and they need clarity. And they want to know what their part 
is going to be because basically people want to be successful. That's true. They want to be with a brand that's going to be successful and they themselves want to be able to do that. So the more that you can communicate. And then the other thing that we did, which I also feel is important, we knew it wasn't going to happen overnight. However, what we needed to do is as we had successes, whether they be small, whether they be large, we communicated them and we celebrated them. So people <coughs> felt the momentum was beginning and they could get excited and they could share that excitement. And they had examples mm -hmm. of where our changes were working. Because whenever you're going through transformation, you know, once you've come out of it and you're building, you sometimes forget the ugly stuff that you had to do. You had to get out of businesses. You had to get out of brands. Um, you know, that first year we had to get out of $150 million worth of businesses mm -hmm. that either didn't fit the brand or weren't quality or weren't relevant. And you've got to make those changes and people need to understand why. Because unless you can communicate that, they're confused. And you don't want that. Or they're scared. People are scared of change in many cases. And we actually said, we're going to celebrate change. We're a live 24 hour a day business. Mm -hmm. Change is basically our DNA, right? So we have to celebrate it and we have to use it to our advantage. You, know, you talk about uh, communicating this and over communicating. What were some of the methodologies that you used to communicate this? Did you boil it down to here's the four tenets of where we're trying to drive so that they could really look at some pillars and, and wrap their arms around this? That's exactly what we did. So at the first level, we rolled out what our vision was going to be, um, which was really to create almost disruption on the retail mm -hmm. landscape. We were going to change the paradigm. Okay. Our mission, to bring the joy and excitement of new discoveries every day. And then we identified six pillars around that that we needed to have. So curate with confidence, ignite impulse, be part of the community, et cetera. So everybody understood what was critical. And then behind that, we said, and here are the three business priorities. Grow our active customer base and the lifetime value of every customer, expand our gross profit, and what we were calling total quality improvement. Our people, our talent, our processes, our execution. And I feel that people can remember three things. Mm -hmm. And if they can not only remember them, but it's incorporated into what their objectives are, mm -hmm. then they'll have it more embedded into what they do. And You've got to keep communicating that. And I think one of the reasons we've been able to keep our momentum is they haven't changed. I think one of the things that companies do is they zig and zag, and then people get very, you know, was this, this vision, this mission? You have to have clarity of purpose, mm -hmm. and you have to get, make people get passionate behind it. So we've had that same working document now. Now, interestingly enough, when we had our five-year anniversary of the relaunch of the brand, we said, it's not time to revisit our vision. It's time to relook at all of that. The world has changed. Digital has changed. Certain aspects of the consumer has changed. Mm -hmm. Do we need to relook at this and not change it, but maybe refresh and update? And that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Interesting. You know, you talked about um, being able to measure the success and celebrate it. What metrics did you use to celebrate success? If you're dropping $150 million to brands, obviously that revenue goes away and you have to find it another way to do something. So, yeah. so what metrics were you using? So given what we were trying to do, which mm -hmm. was completely evolve our brand, right, down mm -hmm. to the font on our stationery, okay. right? We knew that you can't take 24 hours a day of programming, 365 days a year, and change it overnight. But what we did have to do was make some steps, take some mm -hmm. very bold steps. Okay. So for example, in beauty, 70% of our beauty business was in four brands that were exclusive to HSN, and we didn't have a diversified portfolio. The company was having a difficult time attracting prestige and boutique brands, and we needed to do something. I had the opportunity to do a strategic partnership for two years with Sephora. And everyone was like, a retailer and a retailer, and why Sephora? And I'm like, because they'll help us transform our beauty business. In fashion, we had to get out of almost everything we had, except for a few brands that we still have today and have grown, but we didn't have the right product. 
So we did a partnership with Scoop, a very advanced specialty store in New York, and we were able to bring Scoop style. And everyone was concerned, we're not going to be able to sell that product, we're not going to be able to sell those price points, we're giving valuable airtime. I said, you can't always measure something at the moment. You have to measure it as far as what the impact will be. Because if we do this, it will give us tremendous credibility as a fashion brand. Mm -hmm. So the key was identifying those people who had vision and were willing to take the risk with, sure. with you. So uh, Stephanie Greenfield at Scoop or David at Sephora. And, you know, fortunately, they worked and they served as catalysts. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to celebrate that even though in the scheme of things, they were a couple of hours of programming, right? Mm -hmm. But then you all of a sudden saw your profile go up in the marketplace in the trade, we were then able to attract other brands and businesses. So those were the type of things that we had to A, communicate why we were doing it, mm -hmm. and then come back to the organization and give them a little bit of a report card, right? Here's, sure. what, here's why we were doing this, here's what we're doing, and here were the results. And I think the reason you have to do that is not everything is gonna work. And you have to be as open and transparent to say to the organization, you know, we tried this, we put a lot behind it, and you know what, it didn't achieve our expectations, but here's what we learned. And here's what we're going to apply to next time. And I think that tr combination of celebrate the wins and be transparent mm -hmm. about your works in process, I think are really important. You, know, you talk about being able to accept failure and, and challenges that don't necessarily work, pull the plug on those and keep moving on. How have you then been able to turn it into a culture where people understand that? You know, as I speak with entrepreneurs across America, one of the things I like to talk about is how do you build a culture? Because I believe any culture that you have to be assertive and aggressive, uh, as they were talking about the last couple of days, attack rather than defend. Right. And to have a culture where failure is part of the fabric is never easy for people to be able to go out on the limb and make a mistake. Well, I how think, do you do that? I think you have to define what that means. Mm -hmm. And we've spent a lot of time identifying the attributes of individuals that will make them successful in our culture. Mm -hmm. We are a culture of change. We are a culture of strategic risk-taking. And I like to say we take risks, we don't like to commit suicide, right? There's a difference. <laughs> yes. Um, we are a culture of innovation. And if you're going to do that, you're going to have to take inherently those risks. The thing that you have to do, though, is you can't talk through two sides of your mouth. You can't say we want to be this kind of culture and then something doesn't work and you're berating somebody for mm -hmm. failure, all right? Because then nobody wants to take the risk again. So we have a lot of dialogue so that when we are going into something that potentially might be defined as a risk, and not just at my level, throughout the organization, mm -hmm. we talk about it, we identify why we're doing it, we look at what the metrics and what our goal is. And sometimes the goal is less metrics and more impact. Um, and so you go through all of that and then at the end you do a diagnostic. And the way we approach it is not this didn't work, why? It's what have we learned mm -hmm. from this experiment, this launch, this we went in a new direction. But if we didn't do that we wouldn't have some of our most interesting businesses right now. And I'll give you one example. Excellent. A couple of years ago we were with the beauty team, mm -hmm. and we were like, what, what strategic thing can we do that really will differentiate us that our biggest mm -hmm. competitor's not doing, that will change the perspective of HSN in beauty in the marketplace? And you know, so I said, well, I think we should own the fragrance business. It's a business that really needs a catalyst. It's a business of storytelling, right? It's mm -hmm. emotion. We can show that more than anyone else. And everyone said, oh, that's not going to work. You can't sell it on TV. You can't smell it. I'm like, we sell food. You can't taste it. I think we can do it. And uh, one of our partners, um, Steve Stout and Carol's daughter, um, partners with Mary J. Blige, and they were mm -hmm. going to launch her first fragrance. And in speaking with him, he said, why don't we completely break all the rules, and we're going to launch a prestige fragrance exclusively through a direct-to-consumer channel. He mm. said, I'm willing to take the risk if you're willing to partner with me, and you do too, because we had big expectations sure. to do that. And there were a lot of skeptics, 
but we really believe this could be a game changer for us. And there we went in July, I think, uh, 2009, um, which was actually very interesting because most fragrance launches, as you know, were in the fourth quarter. Uh, and we launched uh, My Life, Mary J. Blige's first fragrance, uh, broke every record you can imagine, sold 60,000 bottles of fragrance in a single day in just a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. And we created a new model for the fragrance business. We invested assets in it, certainly, to be able to tell the story um, and to work. We use social media aggressively to do that. And as a result, we have now have a portfolio of fragrances. We had the, uh, the exclusive launch of Jennifer Lopez's last fragrance. Um, and we've been able to build kind of a behind the fragrance franchise at HSN that we never would have done if we didn't take that risk. You, know, you talked about uh, using social media, which I want to come back to, but a lot of what you're doing is finding strong opportunities that you have to identify, analyze, decide which ones you're going to pick. And I'm sure that there are so many different opportunities to go into. It's, it's funny you brought fragrance up as the example. My wife and I were talking about that today because she's excited to see Serena Williams tomorrow. And the idea behind uh, these the celebrities or, or so what, so much with, with these folks and, and how big that industry has been, um, those kind of opportunities, you really as an entrepreneur have to figure out which ones, when you see it, you know that's the right one. What metrics do you use to do so that? So the first metric I don't care if somebody comes to us or we identify it. Do they fit the filter of our brand? Mm -hmm. Do they have a differentiated position? Mm -hmm. Do they fit the culture of our brand? And is our consumer going to have a relationship with that brand, that personality, and that product? And we do a lot of vetting. And it's really important to me it's so much more important what you say no to mm -hmm. than what you say yes to. Because everything you do defines your brand. And if we say yes to something, I mean, how many of us, right, your gut tells you, mm, I always say when I go against that gut, <laughs> you know, then I have nobody to blame but myself, right? So you, you really do have to go through all of that. And again, it doesn't mean that everything is going to work or work perfectly, but at least if you've gone through that process and you've put it through the filter of your brand, and you've put it through the filter of your strategy, your opportunity to be successful is much, much greater. Mm -hmm. And in our world, it's very much not just buying product, not just selling product, but it is about the experience and the personality and the human being themselves. And that human being could be somebody that's a small entrepreneur who created a product in their garage, or it could be Serena Williams or Queen Latifah. Um, but you know what? We are the great democratizer, mm -hmm. right? Think about it. You know, when you're on air at that moment, that person that created that amazing product in the garage is just as big a celebrity as mm -hmm. anyone else we have. So we really have to be diligent about that process and we have to have those relationships. Um, we don't do celebrity for the sake of celebrity. There really has to be a product connection because at the end of the day, the consumer doesn't get the celebrity in their home, they get the product. That's right. You know, you mentioned uh, being on the air and having that, the proof being in the pudding, you know, what are the sales going to be? What kind of time frame do you put on deciding when something is, uh, uh, is going to get pulled? When uh, you know it's not going to work. Maybe the time that it goes on the first time may not be the best time. Your market research uh, didn't pan out exactly where the projections would be. What, what kind of time frame do you get? So, you know, we do plan our business by minute, which yeah. is pretty unique, as you mm -hmm. can imagine. Um, but we're also not reactive, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, we invest a lot to bring the DNA of a brand to life, and our partner invests a lot of themselves. So we work together very, very closely, building the plan, building the strategy. We don't launch a brand on air until we've had an integrated global meeting where every area of the company that's going to touch that brand understands. Mm -hmm. So we want to be a strategic marketing partner as well as a commerce partner. Sure. So when we, f we always say to a brand, at HSN, you almost have to think of your first year as almost 18 months because you need a certain amount of time to fine tune. You need to understand what the consumer's relating to. You need to get comfortable with the storytelling, as much training as you can have in advance. Um, we need to understand 
their product reviews and how they're connecting with you and their product. We need to understand how long it takes to sell a different type of product. Mm -hmm. So we work very closely. So post every show, we do a complete diagnostic. Sometimes in a day, we'll have four shows. And after the first show, we're rewriting <laughs> the second, third, and fourth shows. So we really work closely. And we do have plenty of examples of brands that we had to fine tune. They weren't you know, hitting it out of the park, right out of the mm -hmm. gate. And now they're amazing momentum brands. The other thing though that's important is as long as you keep that transparent communication, because no matter how hard everybody tries, there are things that are not gonna work. And that should never be a surprise to anyone. You've got to have that dialogue because I believe that everything in life is about expectations. Mm -hmm. And if you're aligned and you're creating the communication and the dialogue, then if you do have to part ways, everybody feels they put everything into it they could, and maybe this just wasn't the right moment. That makes sense. You, you've alluded to social media a few times during that you've used social media to push ideas and to communicate. How do you utilize social media at HSN? So I think it's not just social media. What I would say is how do we utilize all of the different platforms we sure. have to engage with the consumer? So what we think of is we think of our digital platform as our 365 day presence and communication vehicle to the customer. And that's everything from hsn.com to our mobile platform, iPad, our new gaming portal, HSN mm -hmm. Arcade, as well as our Facebook, Twitter, all our ways to communicate with the customer. And then HSN TV is the distortion marketing vehicle that creates the content that we can then push through all of those platforms. Okay. The key for us in social media is thinking of it as a two-way dialogue. That is most important, having the conversation, having the dialogue. You know, when you, I think too many people, when they think about social media, it's like, oh, I'm just going to put up a Facebook page. Or I'm going to put, no. The idea is how do you keep engagement? How do you get your consumers talking to each other? Mm -hmm. How do you provide a forum for them to be able to do that? And then how do you work for them to keep that conversation going so it becomes more viral and they become the evangelist for your brand. So we spent a lot of time on that. I think we also look at how we're communicating where, when, and to what group. So for example, when we went to launch Mary J. Blige Fragrance, um, we uh, partnered with Carol's Daughter and we had a very big presence at the Essence Music Festival in New Orleans where women could sign up to get notifications of when Mary was gonna go on through their mobile device. Mm -hmm. They could sample the fragrance. They could sign up to leave a message for Mary and get communication. So you have to think of ways of engagement where the days of asking a consumer to come to you on a specific date and time, done. Yeah. You've got to be where they are. Your brand has to communicate in a personalized and in a relevant way, and you have to let them create the dialogue. When you talk about mobility, do you see that the, the mobile apps and the various mobile devices that are out there, tablets, whatever it may be, is really the next generation of where HSN is headed? Mobile is the future. Yeah. And I say that for many reasons. Um, it certainly is our fastest growing platform. We will eclipse 50 million just in mobile sales, uh, about a third of that coming from the iPad. But the reason being, mobile allows unfettered access, right? Mm -hmm. People on their own terms, how they want to use it. But what's also important is mobile is not one size fits all. You really have to now customize an experience based on how people are using the device. So think of it. People may have a mobile phone. They may be home watching in their living room and watching the TV, but they've decided just to check out on their device. Mobile could be a mom is at a soccer game and she's trying to keep herself a little busy and she's decided to shop or share. Uh, mobile could be, you know what, I know that they're gonna have this great item on at 420 and I've gotta sign up to know where it is. And what mobile allows you to do for brands, products, manufacturers is be much more targeted. So snowstorm in you know, Topeka hey, here's a great deal on a snowblower versus I've got to give you some tanning 
<laughs> products because you know you're somewhere else. Right. So it really allows marketers such customized access, and whether that be local, whether that be you know on the go, whether that be a different type of shopping experience, our iPad application, you can actually customize channels. Um, so again, I think it is changing the landscape dramatically. I think you're in an absolutely fascinating business at a fascinating time. Mindy, thank you very much thank for sitting you. with me. Appreciate it. Thank you.